Uh, I am Scott Ball. I'm a product manager at Esri. I'm joined by James Tedrick. He's also a product manager at Esri. And a little bit later, we're going to have Ishmael Chavite. He's also a product manager at Esri. This morning, we're going to be talking about apps for the field. We're going to be giving you an introduction to uh, our offering. Uh, we have a number of products that you can use, and we're going to be giving you a high-level overview of those apps this morning. It's not a deep dive session. It's more of an overview session uh, so that you can understand what we have so that you can choose other sessions that you may want to dive deeper in and apps that you may be interested in. Um, that being said, this is a repeat from yesterday. So if you were at our yesterday afternoon session, this is going to be the exact same material. So you may want to, uh, you're welcome to stay. We'd love to have you, but you may want to pick another session if you want to uh, see new material. So uh, that being said, this is the Apps for the Field introductory session. Uh, first, I want to highlight the fact that we have a lot of uh, users using our field apps to do some really amazing, incredible things out in the field. Uh, from fire and wildfire response, you see there in the top left, to asset inventorying uh, out in oil fields, uh, there in the top center. We have people out talking to other people, doing census work, survey work, uh, humanitarian stuff like homeless counts. Um, we have people using our apps to do all of these things. Um, not necessarily a field app, but we also have a drone to map, which we're not really going to be talking about today, but that is in one of those um, pictures there to the right. You can use drone uh, imagery and our other product, drone to map, to create really uh, up-to-date, uh, really high-quality imagery-based maps that you can use within the apps that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, you can do high accuracy data collection. So if you need to find things down to the centimeter level, um, we have apps that help you do that. And our customers are using our apps to do all of these very cool, very amazing things today. So we're going to kind of get into that and let you know how you can also maybe someday be up on this picture wall. So our mission statement for the field operations group is to digitally enable mobile workflows with location intelligence so that field work can be completed faster, more efficiently, with better return on investment. Um, the whole thing about this is a lot of people do field work. There are a lot of paper-based processes out there today. Uh, we want to help you do those better with location intelligence and the power of ArcGIS to do things more efficiently. Uh, and a lot of you, probably because you're in this room today, you've already invested in ArcGIS. You already have ArcGIS. So this is just increasing that return on investment, using a lot of apps that you probably already have access to, but uh, may not be aware that you do or may not be aware how to fully uh, engage that and use them to their fullest. So uh, that's what we're all about. Um, when we think about field operations, we think about a number of activities that our users do out in the field. So there are different phases of field work, and we have apps, both web apps and mobile apps, uh, that can help you and your users uh, do these activities better with location. And so kind of starting on the left side of the screen, uh, that's kind of our office-based scenario. Moving out to the right side of the screen, that's our field-based uh, activities. Uh, all of it is being tied together in the middle by the ArcGIS cloud. So all of these things are communicating back and forth with ArcGIS. And so we'll start in the top left, and that's uh, planning. So before you ever go out and do field work, usually you want to plan what work you're going to do. And so we do have applications that help you use location and geography to plan your work better. If you have uh, work going on in one area uh, of the city and then work going on in another area of the city, you might not want to send the same crew uh, to both of them. You might want to send different crews to optimize and make efficient use of their time. So we can help you do that. See the work assignments on the map and assign the right crews to the right places. Once work has been assigned, uh, we'll move over to the navigate phase of, of field operations. And that's actually getting out to that work that needs to be done. Um, there are a lot of turn-by-turn uh, -turn voice guided apps out there today, uh, but we make one that helps you integrate into your GIS system. So you'll have access to your GIS assets, uh, locations, et cetera, uh, so that you can navigate right to those things um, in uh, smart, efficient, optimized ways. Once you're out in the field, you want to understand what's around you. you wanna, we call this situational awareness sometimes. Um, you want to know both the people and the things that are around you. If you want to get to a particular asset, you want to know where that is. 
Uh, if you want to see what people are around you in case you need help or, or backup or whatever it might be, um, that might be another reason you would want to maintain situational awareness while in the field. And we have uh, apps and technology that help you see both of those things. <coughs> Probably by far the most common usage of ArcGIS in the field is the capture phase of work. And so we have a number of apps that help you capture uh, information in a number of ways, whether it's map-based or form-based, or uh, you just want to capture things quickly without really having to know much about GIS, uh, we have a solution for you there. Uh, also, while all the people are out in the field doing work, we have people back in the office that want to monitor what's going on, right? They want to have a big board or a big TV like the one beside me. They want to take a look at that and see what's going on. They want to see where their people are. They want to see the progress of work. They want to see what works in progress right now, what's being completed, what's still left to do. Uh, we have technology to help you do that. And sitting in between the monitor and the planning phase is the coordinate phase. And so this is uh, kind of like planning, but it happens after your people are already out in the field. You want to coordinate with the people that are already downrange or already in the field doing things. Uh, a new task comes up and you want to assign some new work. We can help you do that as well. So my next slide is really just kind of mapping our existing technologies and our existing apps to those phases of field work to kind of help bridge that gap. So again, we'll go around the circle quickly. Uh, when you're planning work, that's going to be workforce for ArcGIS. Navigating, that's navigator for ArcGIS. Uh, the situational awareness, understanding, keeping maps with you in your pocket, that's going to be explorer for ArcGIS. The capture phase, um, again, the map-based app that I was talking about is collector for ArcGIS. The form-based app that I was talking about is Survey123. And uh, the simple, big-button, easy data capture experience is uh, Quick Capture. Moving around the circle, uh, we've got uh, the monitoring phase. And so if you want to see where people are, you've got a new app called Tracker for ArcGIS. Uh, it also has a web component called the Track Viewer, so that managers and dispatchers and commanders can see where their people are in the field. We also have a, a really uh, awesome piece of technology called Operations Dashboard. Uh, we're not going to be talking about Operations Dashboard today, but I highly recommend that you check it out. It pairs well with the field operations workflow. Uh, it allows you to pull data from all kinds of different places, put it on one big screen, and uh, kind of see what's going on and keep a real-time view of what's happening. Uh, on the coordinate phase, uh, that's really going to be a combination of workforce. And so workforce will help you kind of assign new things that come in while your people are out in the field. Uh, you can assign it to them, and it will show up on their mobile device, uh, and they'll kind of get that uh, information while they're in the field. Or uh, Tracker will help you understand where people are, so that you might want to pick which person you send that assignment to. Uh, and Explorer can help people that are already in the field uh, see who's around them, uh, see what's going on around them, the status of work around them. So that's really helping to uh, perform that coordinate phase of work. So that is our high-level overview of the field operations suite of apps. We're going to be taking the next uh, rest of the session to kind of dig into each one of these, give you the high-level overview, uh, take that next level into the app. Uh, we're going to be giving you some demos, so we're actually going to see some of these apps. Um, and yeah, that's it for the overview. So the first app we're going to talk about is Workforce for ArcGIS. Uh, as I've mentioned already, this is the app that you use to plan and coordinate field work. Uh, you can use location awareness to improve efficiency, and that's all about making sure that you're sending the right crews to the right places. You don't have people ping-ponging all over the city, the countryside. Um, it allows field workers to receive and manage field assignments with the mobile app component. So they can receive the work, they can say whether they've started the work, they can mark the work as complete, uh, they can mark themselves as either busy or working or on break or not working at all. And so that information is then communicated back to the dispatcher in the office who can see the, the status of all the field workers in that particular project. Um, that field app, that mobile app, uh, is available on iOS and Android. And one thing to keep in mind about Workforce today is that it is online only. It requires a connection uh, to work. We have a version coming out um, probably in the fall, end of year sometime, that will allow offline work uh, and workforce coordination. So uh, that's Workforce for ArcGIS. Next, next up I'm going to talk about is Navigator for ArcGIS. And this is that turn-by-turn voice-guided navigation app that allows you to get out to your field assets. Uh, there are a lot of turn-by-turn voice-guided apps out there. 
uh, there are some key things that I want to tell you about about Navigator that differentiates Navigator from those other applications. Uh, first is that it works completely offline. You can do search and navigation uh, completely while offline, so it does not require a data connection at all. So that is a big step up just out of the box. The second key thing that I want to talk about is the ability to use your own maps and your own asset inventory. So if you're already creating beautiful base maps, and beautiful background maps, you can use those as the display layer within Navigator. Uh, you also probably have assets that you want your employees or your field workers to navigate out to, whether it's a telephone pole or a transformer or uh, whatever it might be. Uh, you can bake those assets into those offline maps that you're sending out with your Navigator users, and they can search on their device for a specific asset and then navigate right to that asset. The third part of that is being able to use your own custom roads. So this isn't necessarily for everybody, but we have a lot of customers in the timber industries or the oil and gas industries that have your own private road networks. You have uh, dirt roads that get out to well pads. You have uh, single track or two lane roads that get out to timber stands. And so the ability to take those private road networks and blend them with commercial road networks so that your drivers can traverse uh, commercial road networks onto private road networks to get to your assets seamlessly uh, is probably the biggest advantage of why you guys might want to consider Navigator. If those things sound interesting to you, check out Navigator. Um, the final kind of bullet point on Navigator is that it, it's in beta right now, the ability to traverse pre-planned routes. And so this is a pretty neat thing. I'm going to spend a second to talk about it. Uh, for a long time, you've been able to create route layers and publish them to ArcGIS. And so there have been a lot of different ways that you can create route layers and a lot of reasons you might want to create route layers. Uh, one example would be uh, in a delivery scenario, so a package delivery scenario. If you need to deliver 1,000 packages but you only have 25 drivers, uh, you want to take those 1,000 packages, break them up into an optimized, efficient, uh, 25 routes that you can give to your 25 drivers so that they can go deliver those packages. Uh, in the past, you've been able to create the route layer, publish it to ArcGIS. You haven't really been able to do anything more with it uh, in a seamless, easy way. Now, uh, Navigator, uh, it's in beta right now, going to be final in August, has the ability to read those route layers. So being able to pull those optimized routes in and have your users drive along those optimized routes. Um, that's a big feature that a lot of people have been pretty excited about. If you want to join the beta, see me, talk to me, uh, I can get you in there. And uh, I do want to mention it is available on iOS and Android as well. Uh, the next app I want to talk about is Explorer for ArcGIS. And so Explorer is that uh, simple map viewer app that helps your users uh, see the beautiful maps and see all the assets that you have in your GIS asset inventory. Um, just like today, you may uh, send people out into the field with PDF maps. You might be in Pro, you publish a PDF, you put it on their device, you send them on their way. Uh, this is kind of a replacement to that. Uh, and the improvement and the benefit for using Explore instead of just a simple static PDF is that you're going to have asset access to all of your asset information. You're going to have some tools. You're going to have some... I'm not going to call them navigation components, but the ability to uh, guide yourself into a feature that you're trying to find while out in the field. And so this is our really uh, powerful, really great, simple map viewer application. Uh, you want to send your people out into the field um, with the maps that they need to do their job. This is the one to do it. Uh, a lot of times this might get confused with uh, the next app that I'm going to talk about, which is Collector for ArcGIS. Uh, the difference here is that Collector is a data editing app. And Explorer is not a data editing app. You're not doing any data editing here. So uh, for people that you might not want to have access to your GIS information and the ability to change it, you would want to send them out with Explorer because it is a viewer-only application. Um, it works both online with web maps. So you can pull a web map into Explorer and view that. And that's where I'm talking about the situational awareness uh, capabilities. Uh, that web map can be configured to update uh, in near real time, showing you kind of the real time status of features and assets as they move around on the map. Uh, it also has the ability to work completely offline. And so you can, uh, as a GIS uh, analyst or manager or specialist, you can package up what we call mobile map packages that you can put on this Explorer device and allow people to go completely offline with all of the information, the attribute information, the attachments, PDFs, 
whatever you want to add to that mobile map package uh, and send them on their way so that they have everything, uh, even while disconnected from uh, a cellular network. Uh, one other final piece that I do want to mention here is that while it's not an editing app, it does allow those field users to make some quick notes on top of the map. Uh, we call that markup. And so users can create markup. Uh, let's say that they're out in the field and the map says a fire hydrant is supposed to be here and they see that it's actually over there. They can make a quick note on the map or a piece of markup on the map and say, hey, hydrant is in the wrong place. Send it back to the office. And then the person back in the office can take action. They can either move the hydrant uh, in the GIS information on their own, or they can uh, create a new work assignment to send somebody out to, to resurvey the location of that hydrant if it's that important. Um, so yeah, the ability to create and share notes uh, is a pretty key feature of Explorer as well. The next step that I'm going to talk about is Collector for GIS. And this is that data collection, data capture app. Uh, it allows users to uh, create new feature items within feature services and feature layers. It allows people to edit uh, existing uh, values within feature layers as well. And so this is really our map-based data collection app. You would want to use this if you're doing things like asset inventories. You, you don't have an existing uh, GIS um, uh, inventory, I guess it would be to say. Uh, if you want to go out and get all of the locations of all of the things that you need to manage going on in the future, you would probably want to use Collector for ArcGIS for that because it is our map-based data collection app. Uh, the, uh, one of the key things about Collector is it can pair with high-accuracy receivers. So if you want to get accuracy down to the centimeter level, uh, you could pair that with your mobile device, and Collector can use that high-accuracy information to record the location of that asset. Uh, that tends to be very important whenever you have buried assets. So uh, you have everything pulled up, you replace something, you want to get the location of it so that when you come back and you dig things up, you don't have to dig up the whole street. You can just dig up that one little small square um, very accurately. So that is uh, Collector for our GIS. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to pass it over to James and he's going to give us a demo of Workforce, Navigator, and Collector. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> So you can see that I'm here at my organization's homepage, and I've logged in. As Scott mentioned, one of the first tasks we need to do is plan. And we can do that, again, with workforce, as well as set up other components that we'll need as part of our collection. For the demos that we're going to do today, I'm going to do a collection activity around parking meters here in San Diego. So you can see I've set up a web map. This will be used by collector later for collecting new parking meters. I'm now going to jump in to Workforce, and I can easily get to that via the app launcher in my organization. There's a link right here for Workforce for the web front end uh, of Workforce. So this is where I can set up a project and then also have our dispatchers view uh, the conditions, view the uh, project as well as assign tasks. So I'm going to go into this parking meter inventory. And first, I'll show you how I've set this project up. So we have a general uh, page, uh, general overview page of this project. And one of the things that, I can, that I've set up is a separate map for the dispatcher to view and the worker to view. Workforce distinguishes between the dispatcher, the people who assign tasks, and the worker, the people who actually complete the tasks. You can see that this dispatcher view includes the parking meters, as well as the workers, the assignments, and I've also added the traffic service in to provide a situational awareness to basically allow for the dispatchers to judge whether the workers can actually get to the assignment given the current traffic conditions. In the workforce project, I've created the assignments, and you can see here I've created two assignments. The first is to add a parking meter to the inventory, and the second is to inspect an existing parking meter. I've added the users to my assignment. You can see that I am available here as the dispatcher. I've also added myself as a mobile worker. I've also added Scott as a mobile worker. Clearly, he's not active since he's here giving a presentation. And then I also have my friendly worker, Ninja, who is active and will actually be completing the assignment for me.
within Workforce, we can integrate other applications. By default, Navigator is already integrated with Workforce to allow us to get our workers to their assignment. I have also integrated Collector, particularly for the Add Parking Meter task. And as part of this integration, I can actually pass the information from the Workforce assignment into the new feature that will be collected using Collector. So let's actually go into the Workforce project. So I'm now in the dispatcher view, and I can see a couple of tasks. One, we've got two tasks for adding a parking meter, and we also have our friendly worker Ninja, who is represented by this phone. As you can see, this phone is here in the convention center. We already have two assignments, and I can also create an additional one. So I'll create a new assignment to add a new parking meter. I'll assign it to our Ninja. And I can either search for an address, or I can actually just click on the map. And the address is determined automatically. You can give it a priority and a completion date. Provide it an ID. And create this assignment. Now I'm going to switch over to my mobile phone where I'll actually engage and complete the assignments. So I'll open up Workforce. And you can see that we're now updating our assignment list and that we have that new critical assignment added to our, added to our uh, list of tasks to do. So I'll see the assignment, acknowledge that I've received it. And as I acknowledge and provide other information through the workforce and the other applications, this is coming back automatically into uh, the ArcGIS system. You'll see that at the end when I switch back into workforce, the information will be updated automatically. So the first thing I should do is come back here and get myself back into work. So that'll update the dispatcher view and show that I'm now actively working. Come into the assignment and begin the assignment. As we update the status of our assignment throughout this process, we also will again update that dispatcher map. I'll now go and get directions using Navigator to the assignment. So you can see that's plotted out a nice route through the convention center. And that's because currently it's set to look and uh, look for a route that I can achieve via walking. Let me see if I can drive there any quicker. So I can drive there quicker, but as you see, it actually is a little bit a longer route because I'm having to obey the driving uh, abilities, including the lack of U-turns and honestly driving through the convention center that I'm able to do when I'm walking. I'll actually start the walk again and begin navigation. So this is giving me a turn-by-turn -turn direction list that I'm following. Uh, if I didn't have this plugged into the HDMI system and I had it, in, you know, had in, you know, which is sending the audio to non-existent speakers, I would also hear the turn-by-turn -turn directions that occur. So we're walking through. It no there's some knowledge about the paths and sometimes how twisty they are. And then obviously the marina boardwalk, which is a no driving area. This is one of the features of Navigator is that we can create custom transportation networks that differ via mode. So that if you have people who can you know, either walk or perhaps use a bicycle, they can actually have a different roading experience than your staff who are in cars. So we're just about there. Another great thing about uh, <laughs> Another great thing about Navigator is that you can set up, as you are kind of mentioning, uh, custom travel modes. And so those custom travel modes are things like you can provide restrictions so that you have big trucks that you don't want driving on little roads. 
uh, you can set those up. And when you publish your uh, navigation routes, you can keep those big trucks off of those little roads so they don't damage them. Yeah. And it also, if you have private roads, you know, for example, many many uh, companies in the forestry industry or other resource extraction will have private roads that are, you know, only that are essentially only their vehicles can access and approach. Now we've reached our destination, and it prompts me to return back to workforce, where I can then continue my assignment. So the next step in my assignment is to collect the new meter at this location. So I've opened up collector, and you can see that it's already in the mode to add a new feature at the location that we had in our uh, that we at the location that our uh, workforce task uh, provided. I can zoom in, perhaps refine the location for the exact location. Also use my GPS, set what type of meter it is, and then provide additional information such as the meter's configuration. I can submit this. So that's a new, uh, a new feature added in. This map has been designed to work offline. So in order to bring the changes back, I'm going to ask it to sync the changes back in. And, as it, and after it finishes that, I'll return back to workforce. Come back to the dispatcher view. As you can see, this point, which is, what I, which is the task that I started on, shows that it's in progress. I click the Finish button in workforce, and it automatically updates with the, new, with the, with the indication that the task has been completed. So that's a simple example of using Workforce, Navigator, and Collector to create an integrated uh, collection scenario. The next collection app we wanted to talk about is Survey123. Survey123 is a form-centric collection application. Rather than create a map to conduct the collection, the author, the author will create a form. And, from that, and for that, you don't actually need an existing table to collect from. As part of creating the form, we'll actually create the feature service that matches that form. You can also use existing feature services if you already have them available. It's also designed to work in a variety of contexts, both on the mobile device, where it supports both online and offline collection, as well as on the web. So that you know your users, whether they have, whether they're doing uh, filling in forms out in the field or in the office, they're able to do so on the device that makes the most sense for that context. To show how that can work and and show a maybe a little bit less structured collection scenario, I now want to show how we can use Explorer and Survey One Two Three to create an integrated inspection workflow. So for that. I'll return back to my phone and enter Explorer. As Scott said, Explorer is our offline capable map viewing environment. Again, I've loaded in more or less the same map. The one difference with this map is that I've modified the pop-up slightly. You can see here, I have the information of the meter, and I also have this nice big green button area that says Open Inspection Form. This Open Inspection Form button We'll open up Survey123 and open up the correct uh, inspection form for the parking meters. This is done via a series of uh, hyperlinks that, as opposed to opening up a web browser, open up the application Survey123. That's also the same process that you saw when I went from Workforce and opened up Navigator and Collector. So now that I've got the form open up with the correct meter information, I can provide information on the meter. Note the issues that are present. Describe what actually happened. In this case, a false alarm. I just had to unplug and replug in the meter, just like your Wi-Fi. And then submit the information. After submitting the information, I can actually just return back to Explorer and continue on my way, document the next meter's condition. 
So again, that's a less structured method where you may have a sector or an area to patrol versus a set of designated tasks. Next up, we want to uh, talk about our newest capture application, Quick Capture. And for that, we'll have Ismail come up. <laughs> Thank you, James. I will come quickly. So uh, Quick Capture is a new um, mobile application for field data capture. And you might be wondering, another one? We didn't have enough with collector and survey. Well, the reality is that we are working hard to offer the best possible experience for different data capture workflows. And the user experience is key for people in the field. So we developed this idea of an application that basically using big fat buttons would allow people to capture information in GIS quickly. This makes the application extremely simple and ideal for rapid and at speed data collection workflows. I'm going to give you a quick uh, demonstration. So you're looking at my phone. I have quick capture. You can actually download it from the store already. We support the application on Android, on Windows, and also on iOS. And you can see that the application has a bunch of big buttons. These buttons represent GIS features from your maps. So you author a feature layer with different categories. And then each of these categories become a big button. What do you have to do to say, use this road debris reporter? Push on the buttons as you see debris on the road. Say you are driving. So say road marker, you simply tap on that guy. And that's it. We get the location from the device and we create the GIS feature. It's that simple. So here at the top, you can see that we have a little um, button that allows you to send the data. And that's pretty much the experience. Now, you can configure, of course, your projects using different techniques. In this case, for example, you can see that the buttons have been color coded because that means something to the first responder. This is an urban search and rescue project. And you can organize these categories in groups that you can collapse and expand for quick access. Most importantly, the buttons in this case are configured with photos. So if I tap on a, on a particular button, I can now capture a photo. So this is a animal, animal hazard. So do like, rawr, rawr. yeah. So that goes, that's scary, pretty good. So that goes into the database as an attachment. Furthermore, you can configure these buttons with behavior. What happens when you push the button? Maybe a photo is triggered, but also you can use what we now call our device variables. You can capture the speed at which the user is moving, the direction of travel, the time when the user pushed the button. Last project I want to demonstrate is this one, love for walks and bikes. Say you work in the city and you want to map sidewalks, bike paths, and issues, obstacles for pedestrians and bicyclists. You would create a project like this. The interesting one here is that when you tap on the bike path, for example, button, it activates the button. It's not like a one-time thing is a continuous data capture mode. As you move along, it creates the path. You can, with quick capture, activate multiple buttons at once. So if you are doing pavement condition, you can do pavement condition, but also at the same time, capture guardrail on the right, guardrail on the left. And if you see an issue, while these polylines are active, you can actually capture that photo. Oh, sorry about that and store it into the database. So this capability of capturing multiple um, features at the same time is kind of uh, very, very useful. To create these projects, you can use a web experience. It's called Quick Capture Web Designer. It's very simple to use, all drag and drop, visual. You can change the look and feel of your buttons, the layout of your project, but also the behavior associating these device variables. Uh, Scott will talk um, in more detail about the licensing later, but the application is actually already included with your field worker, creator, and GIS professional user types, so you can download it and use it right away. If you want to learn more about it, we have a technical workshop today at 2.30 in room 10. We also have a GeoNet group where we can 
uh, you can join the discussion and see some blogs and tutorials that we already have in GeoNet. Sweet. Thank you. Great job, Ishmael. Are you guys excited? Does that look cool? Awesome. All right, the next one that we're gonna talk about today is Tracker for ArcGIS. Tracker is another brand new application. Um, Tracker is all about sharing your location while your field workers are in the field. Uh, it helps your uh, dispatchers and commanders and managers back in the office know where people are. And so this is a pretty neat little application. It currently is on ArcGIS Enterprise only. We're in beta in ArcGIS Online, so if you're interested in using it with online, uh, come see me and we can try to get you into that beta. Uh, but this is a really simple user experience from the mobile side. You really just download the Tracker for GIS app. Uh, it has a button that says, uh, start tracking me. And the user can turn that on or turn that off. And so when they turn that on, what happens is their last known location begins being transmitted back to ArcGIS, uh, where the authorized people within their organization who are allowed to see their locations can then see their locations. Um, we've seen a lot of uptake in this in the beta phases and in the early phases with uh, public safety, first responders, especially associated around uh, big events. So we've, had a, we've supported a number of big events with Tracker. So we've had police and fire personnel uh, install Tracker on their phones for the Rose Bowl, for a Gold Cup match that happened in Pasadena. Uh, there have been a no, uh, number of other big events that we have supported that have allowed kind of the uh, command center folks to see where all of their fire and uh, police resources are on site so that if something happens, they can make sure that they have the right person responding to the thing that just happened. Uh, there are a lot of other uses for Tracker for ArcGIS, but those are kind of the most popular ones that we've seen uh, immediately. Uh, another big thing about Tracker is that privacy can be a touchy issue. Um, some other uh, providers of these kinds of devices and these kinds of services uh, will take your data and they will monetize it by uh, selling it or marketing it or using it to market to you. Uh, Esri does not do that. Esri basically just builds the tool and you own your location data. So your organization owns your location data. Esri doesn't have anything to do with it. It's yours. Um, that's an important thing. I know a lot of people are concerned about that. Just wanted to kind of put that out there up front. So what does Tracker look like? I do actually want to kind of switch over and show you uh, what Tracker looks like. So if I could get the device, uh, there we go, that's number five. Um, so we'll take a look at the mobile device first. And so hopefully that will come up. There we go. Okay, so this is just my iPhone. Uh, I have a field operations group, and so tracker is that button there in the middle with a little squiggly line. Uh, when I tap on it, it brings me up to, as I said, a really simple interface. It's really just uh, an on and off button. If I don't wanna be tracked, I can slide that to off. If I wanna be tracked, I can slide it to on. I can also see my location tracks. And so if I zoom out, I can see where I've been today. So by default, it's set to show you where you've been today. And so I went and got coffee, and then I came here to do the presentation. That's where I've been. I can also say, where have I been yesterday? And so I've been a few more places yesterday, and all the way back to the last 72 hours. And so that uh, is a little bit more interesting set of tracks. And so that might be useful if you're doing uh, damage assessments after a storm or something, and you don't know exactly where you've been. The landscape's kind of hard to figure out. Uh, you can say, yes, I've already been down this street. I need to go down the next street, or uh, so on. So that's really simple interface. Uh, a few options in there that you can take a look at. Uh, you can also set reminders. So this doesn't track you automatically. I had to manually turn that on and turn that off. Uh, but what we can do is we can set some reminders. So if my day starts at like 9 a.m. and ends at 5 p.m., I can say, hey, send me a reminder to stop tracking or start tracking uh, at one of those uh, set points. Uh, I can change the coordinates, I can use dark mode or not use dark mode, I prefer dark mode, it's, it's less strenuous on the eyes. Uh, you can configure a little bit more information, but we don't anticipate most people will mess with these kind of settings. Uh, we figure they'll just have the app, turn it on, and then go about their day. It can run in the background, it stores all the tracks locally, uh, so that if you happen to go offline, you've got all your information with you, and then you can upload that the next time that you get uh, into service. That will happen automatically. Uh, so with that, I'm going to show you, uh, let's see, I'm four. 
what the web view of that looks like. So me as a user, I can really only see my tracks on there. And so when that information gets passed back, uh, the commander, dispatcher, whoever it might be, they will be authorized to see the people within their team. So that's all something that you set up. You have complete control over who sees what. And so uh, I have been authorized to see the field operations team as we move around San Diego. And so, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, let me switch from extending my desktop to duplicating my desktop. There we go. Okay, so uh, as James showed you earlier, whenever you're in your ArcGIS organization, in the top right-hand corner, there's the app launcher. Uh, in there, you have a number of things. One of them is Workforce, which he showed you earlier. There's also Track Viewer. And so whenever I click on Track Viewer, uh, it opens up this interface. And so this interface is showing me the last known locations for the people on my team. And so the tracks are grayed out right now because I don't have any of the team members selected. But if I were to select somebody, like let's say Scott Ball, uh, I will see all of my tracks for the last, let's say, 24 hours. I can adjust those filters, I can change them. Um, if I go down through these options on the left, I can filter down, I just wanna see the last eight hours. Uh, and you can see that when I do that and click apply, uh, this time filter up here changes and it just filters down to the last eight hours. Uh, I can also, uh, if I'm seeing a lot of noise in my data, because this is really just uh, as accurate as the location on my phone. So if my phone's really inaccurate in some places, if I'm inside, uh, I can filter that down and say, only show me ones where it's, the device is really sure we know where the person is. And when I click apply there, it filters out a lot of that noise. Some other options include uh, speed. So if you wanna see when people are speeding, you can filter down to just show me everything over 65 miles an hour. Uh, or if you want certain travel modes, only show me when uh, I was driving. Uh, you can see that it kind of grayed out. If I say only show me where I was walking, that's gonna show me a little bit more. Uh, I happen to take a scooter here, so it thinks scooting is driving. Uh, so that's Tracker. That's Tracker for ArcGIS. It's, it's a pretty neat application. As I said, it's, it's seeing a lot of uptake right now in, in first response, public safety, that kind of thing. Let me go back into presentation mode. So uh, we'll hold for questions at the end. We're actually very close to finishing up. Yeah, we're getting there. Okay, so that was our little Tracker demo. As I mentioned, uh, it's available today in Enterprise 10.7. Uh, if you want to use it with online, it's in beta right now, and you can come talk to me and we can get you in that beta. Uh, so as you've seen today, uh, you can really do a lot of things by pairing these apps together, and there are a number of workflows you can accomplish when you do that. Uh, by no means do you have to use every single one of our applications. Uh, we'd like it if you did. We think they're pretty great, but you don't have to. Uh, if you have certain workflows that would be accomplished by just kind of snapping off one or two of the apps, uh, these are some common pairings of apps. You've already seen the one in the middle, that Workforce Launchpad, where you have a Workforce and it kind of launches you into uh, Navigator to get where you need to go, and then launches you into Collector to actually do the data capture. Uh, that's a pretty common one. Uh, so is that Explore to Survey one, where you use Explore to kind of see the, the assets or things that need to be surveyed around you, uh, and then link right into survey. That's what James was showing earlier. Um, there's also another interesting one that I want to mention is this third-party integrations down in the, the bottom. Uh, that is uh, the ability to use your own custom applications, your own custom mobile apps, uh, and you can build in that same linking back and forth capability. Like We build our apps to work well together, and so uh, we do that using some, as James was mentioning, URL scheming technology. Um, they just fire off the other app, and the other app knows exactly which feature to work with or which map extent to go to or whatever um, because of that uh, URL scheming technology. We also open that up to you. So if you want your app to work with our apps just as seamlessly as you were seeing from James, you can absolutely do that. Uh, we're not going to go into that in detail in this session, uh, but again, that is something that you can find in our documentation. Uh, for almost all of the apps, we have some samples and some um, code showing you how to do that and how to create those links like James showed. Um, just kind of putting that out there in case you're interested. Next thing I want to talk about is licensing. And so spend a few minutes on this because licensing has changed since last year. Uh, last year, this time, we had basically two uh, user types or, or named user levels. We had level one, which is essentially a viewer, 
and level two, which was kind of everything else. It was kind of the high powered user. And so there were two price points, uh, low price, high price. And some people uh, felt that the high price was too high uh, to send people out into the field. They didn't want to give those level two named users to their field workers because it was too much cost um, to send a, a giant field workforce out into the field with a bunch of level two named users. Um, we heard you. That feedback was well received. And so we have uh, created user types. And so user types um, are more granular in terms of capability and in terms of pricing. And so now we have at the very far left the kind of lowest capability level, which just allows people to view GIS data within your ArcGIS organization. That kind of gives them that named user account, so they have the security credentials to see the things in your organization, but they don't have the ability to change anything or create anything new. They can just view. And as you might expect, that's the lowest cost option. Uh, moving towards the right, we've got the editor, which can edit some things. They can't create anything new in your ArcGIS organization in terms of, of layers or items in ArcGIS, but they can take an existing feature layer and edit some items within it. Next step up is the field worker user type. And so the field worker is really uh, most important to what we've been talking about today. The field worker uh, has that ability to edit items that have already been created. Uh, the field worker can't create new items, but it can edit uh, items that have already been created, like the editor, but it also comes with the field apps bundle. This is Esri talk, this is, what you need to know is that it comes with some apps. It comes with a lot of the apps that you've seen today. And so, which apps specifically? It comes with Workforce, Collector, Survey123, and Quick Capture. So if you buy the field worker user type for your users, those are the apps that they get by default. Um, I also want to mention that Explorer, that simple viewer application, comes with all of the user types. So you can use it with all of the user types, including the field worker. So really the field worker comes with Workforce, Collector, Survey123, Quick Capture, and Explorer. So that's a lot of stuff. And so if you want your people to go out and start working, that field worker, less expensive than that old level two name user, but still comes with the apps that they need to get their work done. If you want to use our premium apps, we have two premium apps. Those are Navigator and Tracker. And so those come with an additional fee on top of that field worker user type. So if, uh, as we were talking through Navigator and Tracker today, those were interesting to you, uh, I do want to let you know that that is going to be an additional fee on top of the field worker user type. That being said, uh, where can you learn more about these? We have a full uh, set of tech workshops around all of these applications. There's a lot that, have ar that has already been done, but there's still a lot to come too. And so we have a full list of those tech workshops. If you go to that bit.ly link, it's bit.ly slash ucfield19. Uh, one of our colleagues, Derek Law, wrote this really great blog highlighting all of the field operations, uh, technical sessions, and demo theaters, and uh, everything that you need to know to learn about field operations. Uh, we also have a uh, special interest group for the field operations team today uh, from 11.30 to 12.30. Um, that's going to be a really neat opportunity to hear from users. Uh, we have three uh, users lined up that will be talking about how they use field operations within their organizations to accomplish their workflows and be successful. So if you want to hear how other people are using field operations in their organizations, come to our field ops SIG. Uh, today at 11.30. Um, with that said, uh, please share your feedback about this session. Please let us know how we did. If you go in the app, if you tap this session, you can leave feedback for us. Let us know uh, how we did. We would very much appreciate if you did that. Uh, and we have, I think, about five to ten minutes left if there are questions. So I'm going to go maybe back a slide so you guys can have this information, take pictures, whatever. And if you have questions, now's the time. Salmon shirt. Do you know that one? Yeah, I can. Sure. So the question was, uh, can we talk a little bit about external receivers that work with phones, uh, specifically? You know, and we, you know, there's well-known high accuracy, as in. You know, sub meter, sub centimeter ones are, you know, and then you know, what else is out there? There are also uh, definitely other providers that are, especially in, say, the 
probably meter to two, three meter range. You'll find them down there. Um, the you know, for example, I think you know you might want you know the brands of external. I don't want to necessarily favor one brand over another, but yeah. you know the list of receiver companies downstairs in the expo include Bad Elf, uh, Juniper Systems, um, EOS, uh, Genec, uh, Trimble, um, Garmin. Uh, I think that that's most of them. I might be missing one or two, but those are the ones, those are like the top ones that we hear our other, our customers using. We personally at Esri don't do like certification or testing of GPS devices aside from ensuring that they, ensuring that, you know, models will work with our software. And we do have that documented, uh, primarily within the collector help, but Survey 123, which also uses external receivers, uh, links over to that. Um, you'll actually find some really good work, especially by the U.S. Forest Service, in terms of uh, real field performance and accuracy. Forest Service obviously has a lot of land with a, you know, despite the name, a lot of land use types, uh, you know, that uh, you know that provide that provide different challenges for different receivers. Some are better, say, in a full canopy situation. Mm -hmm. Some are, you know, some are designed to get you the best possible accuracy when you have open sky. Yeah. Yeah, right here, orange. So, Yeah, so the question was, um, all these applications that we talked about, do they work with both RGS Online and Enterprise? And, and yes, they do. And I've called out where they don't. Like with Tracker right now, it's, it's Enterprise only for now with Online and Beta. Uh, the rest of them work on both Enterprise and Online. Yeah. Do you export your tracker information as layers? So it's stored in its own special database, like a high performance database, but it is exposed as a feature view, feature layer view. So you can use it in other uh, places on the platform with that feature layer view. Uh, you can export it. There are some limitations with online, I believe, but with enterprise, I think you have full access to, to all of it. Yeah. Right here first, and then we'll go to you. I'm sorry. Can you group them by teams for tracker? So the question was for tracker, can you group them by teams? And I assume you're referring to the track viewer, the web application where I was seeing all the people together. So yeah, you can. Um, you you are in complete control of who can see what. So you will create teams and projects, and then you will put people into those teams. And the the people that have the ability to view who's in that team can see all the people within that project. Can you see, so for us, we uh, okay, so the follow-up uh, to that question was not just can I see where the individuals are, but can I see where the teams are? And so Tracker isn't really designed to work that way. Tracker is designed to see last known locations of people uh, and named users. And so you can't really like aggregate those into one kind of meta object. It sounds like that's what you're asking for. You would maybe, I mean, you would probably maybe designate like the team leader as the representative point, you know, to, you know, for that would be maybe the way to work with that. Yeah. But right now it's designed to just track people. All right. I saw back here in the hat. Yes, so I use uh, Explorer on the field, and uh, my work is so large that my mapping is so Yeah, so the question was, uh, the user uses Explorer in the field. They're experiencing, they have some very large, I'm assuming base maps, imagery, something that they use. Um, they're hitting a limit that they can't download it. Uh, do they have any options? And so you can totally sideload uh, information onto your devices as well. So the way that you get offline information into Explorer is through a mobile map package. And so there are two ways of delivering that mobile map package to the Explorer device. One is hosting it in ArcGIS and having the mobile user download it from ArcGIS. Another is loading it directly onto the device. And so if you load it directly onto the, to the device, you're not gonna have any problems with downloading or downloading speeds or downloading caps. You can push as much as you want over there. Explorer does not have a limit in the size of map package that it can open. Yeah. 
So there's a couple of aspects there. Our base maps are limited in terms of the number of tiles you can download. Um, and, and so it's not a direct size limitation, it's the number of tiles. One aspect that would certainly make it smaller, though it may not affect the number of tiles, is instead of using the, you know, the, what we're going to call probably now traditional uh, imagery or uh, image tile base maps, the, uh, the ones that if you look at the base map, it's really just a JPEG at the bottom, is to instead use the vector tile base maps. Those are much smaller uh, in terms of the amount of data being downloaded. Um, the other would be to, yeah, work and create the packages offline with, you know, your own data on that instead would be maybe what we'd look at. Yeah, and, and the other aspect that I do recommend when you're looking, uh, so the person was mentioning that they use the most zoom-in, in terms of reducing the number of tiles, the quickest way to reduce the number of tiles for any package or base map is to cut off that very last layer. The very last layer will represent something on the order of about three quarters of the size, given the way caching works by creating four tiles for each new layer where you had one tile previously. Yeah, and if, if you want to go more uh, more yeah. detailed, more deep, you can visit us down in the expo. And we have got a lot of product engineers from the yeah. Explorer team that can help We also you. have demo theaters on, create, on best practices for creating maps. And ma'am, I know you had a question earlier, so. Yeah, so the question was, if I wanted to, could I configure it so the teams could see each other instead of just the manager seeing everybody on their team? Uh, if everybody's using Tracker, could I configure it so that everybody can see everybody? Uh, you could configure it that way if you wanted to. Can you review which data and which are available? Sure. Um, so the question was, can you uh, recap which ones are in beta and which ones are available? So I believe everything we've talked about today has at least a production version out. Uh, most yeah. of the apps that we talked about today are also in beta in some form. Yeah. So you can join the betas for the apps that you like to see the, the future stuff, um, but they all have um, production, released, yeah. Yeah, released production versions as well. Tracker? tracker is released. It's just not available on ArcGIS Online at this point. Yeah, it's released on Enterprise right now. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for joining us.